Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Uh, I'm Wyatt Gordon. I'm the facilitator for this, assess this session on assessment learning and instruction. Uh, I am currently Senior Vice President at Pearson View, which is a licensing and credentialing arm of Pearson and head of evaluation systems, which is a subsidiary of Pearson View focused on the licensing and credentialing of educators. Uh, prior to my time at Pearson, I was Associate Vice President of Operations at ETS and had leadership accountability for all of ETS's educated, educator related products and services. Uh, interestingly, you know, most of my re research has focused on uh, education policy and business, but I've also spent considerable time studying and thinking about the of learning environments. So this session, assessments integrating teaching and learning is uh, near and dear to my heart for that reason. I'm really excited to be joined by uh, the star-studded panel of assessment experts we have here, um, and very much looking forward to hearing what they have to say uh, on the topic. So the topic of assessments integrating teaching and learning is a topic that Edmund Gordon has grappled with over the last decade or so of his career. His work with the Gordon Commission on the Future of Assessment and Education positioned the integration of teaching and learning with assessment as the next frontier for assessment. Conceptually, this makes a ton of sense, of course. You know, who am I to disagree, right? Uh, we know that teachers use assessment ubiquitously every day in the classroom, perhaps every moment. They use informal techniques like probing, leading open discussions, quizzing. They use problem-based learning to understand where their students are and where they need to go. You know, the act of assessing is central to pedagogy. And capital A assessment, as I like to call it, or the assessment tool itself, uh, on the other hand, has been seen as disconnected uh, from teaching and learning. And, you know, perhaps, perhaps rightfully so. Uh, the summative purposes of large scale uh, high stakes testing are different than the informal, the, the purposes of informal techniques that teachers employ on a day to day basis. It's that dichotomy that really defines the contemporary political debates around assessment and its use. And it's also uh, pushed, I think, Ed Gordon to bring this, to solve those disparate purposes and bring them into alignment with each other. So his current work focuses on how to utilize the excellent work that has created and sustained those capital A assessments and the assessment tools and those concepts uh, the, that informal assessment uses to bring them perhaps to, you know, to the messy and informal work of teaching learners. So, you know, for many of us that have engaged with him on this topic over the last few years, it's been uh, a bit of a daunting and confusing task. So I've been very interested to hear, you know, the, uh, the conversations yesterday and today and the brainstorming about how we bridge that gap. Um, also excited to continue that conversation today. So I'm gonna jump right into my session and then subsequently each of our presenter sections. So the title of my brief section here is called uh, Flexible Teacher Licensure Assessment. Uh, and the title itself may be a bit of a misnomer uh, since I'm sure that every step in the uh, history of teacher licensure, purveyors of teacher licensure have considered the current assessment requirements to be flexible. And you know that may be a surprising statement for some folks, but I'm gonna explain what I mean. There's a great paper on the history of teacher licensure titled uh, Knowledge for Teachers, the Origin of the National Teachers Examinations Program by Ann Wilson, for those of you that are interested. I won't go into details on that history now, but Ben Wood, the creator of the National Teachers Exam, which was the first large scale teacher licensure assessment system, said in 1939 that since teaching ability was a complex, complex combination of numerous interacting factors, it was not reasonable to expect that any one of the essential factors of teaching to correlate highly with the total complex. Instead, Wood argued that the test should be judged by how accurately they measured those parts of teaching that they were designed to measure. So in Wood's mind, the flexibility afforded by teacher licensure tests was born out of necessity, since we couldn't test everything that makes a teacher able to perform adequately, governing bodies needed to prioritize and describe for themselves the standards expected of their teacher workforce and to test competency against those standards. So for our purposes today, I'd like to call that flexibility of scope. 
Flexibility of scope has been a hallmark for teacher licensure for the last 90 years. We assess mostly content knowledge. Sometimes we assess pedagogical knowledge. But even when we assess pedagogical knowledge, it's, list, it's limited to the pedagogical theory in most cases. Uh, and you know that approach to testing has been replicated in state standards for teachers, which is of course what we accept, what we assess competency of. So you might be asking yourself, you know, why does any of this matter? So you know, my work has largely, largely explored new types of flexibility for teacher licensure. I like to call it flexibility of scale. All right. Uh, the key question is, what's the right size for teacher assessment, and how does it fit into a larger system of certification? or if you will, a larger system of teaching and learning. You know, because in, in my view, every system of certification is just a system of teaching and learning. So at Pearson, we've tackled this problem in a few different ways. Uh, the first are applied approaches. And you know, I think the best example of this currently is the EdTPA, which is a video-based performance assessment. Additionally, we've explored some simulation-based assessments and a new model of assessment called FLEX. I'm not going to go into detail on any one of those in particular, but at the core, you know, the question is, do we need a three hour multiple choice test or can we deconstruct tests in order to in order to just uh, distill the critical performance elements and then ask teachers to actually perform them. And what's great about this approach is that it allows for integration into learning experiences. So for example, EdTPA is currently done during a, or typically done during a, a teacher-student teaching, which is their key learning experience as a novice teacher. The second way that we've attacked this is, by, is what I call capital A assessment or the assessment tool itself versus assessing. And what I mean here in terms of situated approaches and assessment versus assessing is flexibility in scale also means assess accepting new types of demonstrations of competency beyond just multiple choice testing and even beyond performance elements. So I mentioned flex in the in the previous bullet, uh, but this is at the heart of the flex approach. You know, how do we leverage learning experiences and specifically the outcomes of those learning experiences as proof of competency? And how do we broaden what we include as proof of competency to include experiences that are rooted in learning and growing? You know, most importantly, can we move the production of those artifacts into the curriculum itself? And, uh, you know, that's what I mean by situated. Moving all or parts of an assessment domain to a context where those types of artifacts are likely to be produced. All right. In the context of teacher education, I think situating licensure assessment in the process of learning can really change, uh, can change a lot. And the third strategy we've used is the use of maturity models. And here I refer to it as, comp as competency versus mastery. And you know, the reason for that is that the licensure and certification process focuses on minimal competency across a, a, a wide range of domains and subjects. And so while there's lots of good reason for that, there's been a push for more meaningful assessments that are predictive of teacher performance. Um, you know, that's a difficult problem to solve as not every teacher needs to be a master teacher but we do need to protect students from teachers that might impede their learning. The uh, National Board for Professional Teaching Standards in partnership with Pearson delivers performance assessments for accomplished teachers. Those assessments are both situated and applied. However, importantly, they also build on foundational learning and teacher preparation and in induction and in workplace learning. It's in that way that those exams fit into a system of assessments that are both embedded with learning and evaluate learning throughout a teacher's career and maturity. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, I spent a little bit of time discussing kind of where we are today, what we've done, how we've approached, uh, you know, the, the critical need to make licensure assessments more flexible and to embed them in learning. But I've also, you know, I'd like to pose a couple of questions or problems that I'm thinking about for the future. I don't know the answers, you know, if, if anyone does, then please do grab me and let's, let's have a conversation. Um, but the first question is, you know, how, how do we think about validity and reliability as assessment or assessing becomes more flexible in scale? You know, there's a, it's a major debate as assessments move from those traditional longer multiple choice tests to new modes of assessing. 
you know, how do we think about psychometric innovations that can provide new guardrails for new types of assessment and assessment modalities? You know, from, from my perspective, the, the real question here is, are our current psychometric techniques fit for purpose as we look to more co closely couple assessment with learning? You know, where do we go? What, where are we looking towards? And the second question is, how do we build assessment designs that prioritize feedback and outcomes to enable their use and learning in smaller scales? You know, I, I do think that performance assessments are a step in the right direction, but um, you know, I'm sure that we can go much further. And uh, you know, we should think about as as practitioners and uh, and sometimes users of these tools. Uh, you know, how do we start with the feedback that we want to deliver? And how do we reverse engineer assessments that may provide new, new innovations in our space? And then finally, maybe maybe most importantly, you know, how do we leverage technology to innovate in learning environments so that we can bring assessments and learning uh, into closer conversation with each other? So those are the ideas that I'm thinking about for the future. You know, I, I do think the answers will provide a useful blueprint for the future of my space, which is licensure assessment. Um, anyway. Thank you all for your time. I'm gonna hand it over to my esteemed colleague, Randy Bennett. And Randy, I'm gonna give you a brief introduction because you know the, the bio is impressive and people need to hear it. So R Randy holds the uh, Norman O. Fredrickson Chair of Assessment at ETS. His work focuses on designing assessment approaches intended to positively impact teaching and learning. And his recent work centers on social, social culturally responsive assessment. Randy is the past president of the International Association for Assess Educational Assessment and past president of the National Council on Measurement and Education. Go for it, Randy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wyatt. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's really an honor to be part of this celebration of Ed Gordon's legacy. Next slide, please. My opening statement concerns socioculturally responsive assessment, or SCRA. Next slide, please. My statement is inspired by the bolded portion of this quote from the report of the Gordon Commission, which says, assessment, teaching, and learning will out of necessity have to be appropriate to the diversity in the populations that must be served and informative of the teaching and learning processes in which they will be embedded. SCRA, socio-culturally responsive assessment, is a conception intended to be consistent with this idea, that is be appropriate to the diversity in the populations that must be served. So what is SCRA? Next slide, please. You might think of SCRA as one member of a larger family of related approaches that includes such approaches as culturally responsive assessment, universal design for assessment, socio-culturally responsive classroom and formative assessment, anti-racist assessment, justice-oriented assessment, culturally responsible and sustaining assessment, as well as others. These approaches differ in the populations that they target, which sometimes overlap, in the underlying literatures that they're built upon, in their basic premises, in the goals that they aspire to achieve, and in their rhetorical stances. However, they probably share at least one key idea in common, and that is to design for the social, cultural, and other relevant characteristics of individuals and the context from which they come. How does SCRA, as one member of this family, elaborate upon that key design idea? Next slide, please. Here's a working definition based on principles that have been drawn from various literatures. SCRA includes problems that connect to cultural identity, background, and lived experiences because individuals will be better able to demonstrate what they are capable of in context in which they are familiar versus unfamiliar. SCRA allows forms of expression and representation that help individuals show what they know and can do because different modes of representation, different modes of expression 
are more or less common in different communities. SCRA promotes deeper learning by design because those in underfunded schools are less likely to have been exposed to deeper learning. SCRA adapts to personal characteristics, including cultural identity, so as to customize the assessment for the individual. And finally, SCRA characterizes performance as an interaction among what an individual brings to the assessment and what it is that individual is being asked to do and the context in which the individual is being asked to do it. To recognize that we need to condition our interpretations of performance on such things as opportunity to learn, background, the kinds of tasks we present, and the context in which we present them. Socioculturally responsive assessment is assessment that people can see and affirm themselves in and from which they can learn. You should be able to see in this definition the influence of Ed Gordon because he has for many years argued for assessment that is affirmative and assessment that is educative. A growing trend in education is the development of AI-based personalized learning systems. What are the implications of socio-culturally responsive assessment for assessments that are built into these systems? Such systems are often said to be the solution to equity issues because by definition, they're personalized. Next slide, please. However, personalization via AI doesn't automatically result in responsiveness because effective personalization requires knowing a number of things. It requires knowing what variables are important to personalize on. It requires knowing how to measure those variables effectively. It requires knowing how those measured variables behave conjointly because they may not behave conjointly in the same way as they, they behave on their own. And it requires knowing how to use that conjoint behavior to adjust content and its presentation. In other words, there's no magic equity bullet in AI-based personalization. Personalized doesn't necessarily mean equitable. Next slide, please. My take home message then is that SCRA principles can help us integrate assessment with learning and teaching in ways that advance equity. Perhaps the most critical point is that equity occurs by design through action that is intentional, principled, focused, and persistent. Equity by design is for me the essence of Ed Gordon's legacy. Thanks very much. Thanks, Randy. Uh, I, I appreciate the insight and the comments on equity by design. I couldn't, couldn't agree more, and I think they, they certainly do. Those comments do ring true. I'm going to introduce Zenaida Aguirre Munoz, who is our next speaker. She is professor of cognitive science and quantitative systems biology at UC Merced. And her research focuses on the integration of cognitive science, linguistics, and model-based assessment. Um, Zenaida, go ahead. Maybe muted. Sorry, go, go ahead and uh, present the next slide. Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so I'm glad that uh, Dr. Bennett finished with equity by design, and I think pushing that a little bit further is that's going to require some disruption in the assessment systems, right, and disruption in the expectations. And so, um, but there's, of course, tensions in, um, tensions in this work. Go ahead, next slide. Um, and um, so... Reaching equity for underserved student population requires assessment that involves teachers and students on a daily basis, right? So I think we're all here understand that assessment happens every day in classrooms. Um, while large scale assessments is important, does impact instructional decision making, the daily assessment practices and activity systems have the greatest potential for improving learning opportunities that lead to equitable outcomes um, in public schools. In the, in the past, um, much of the literature on formative assessments largely overlooked the disciplinary substance of what teachers and by extension their students should be assessing, right? So the, what, was, what was being assessed during these formative assessment um, 
moments. The focus appeared to be on strategies that cut across topics and disciplines such as wait time, right? Waiting for students to respond, uh, stop lighting, for example, questioning without closely examining the ideas and reason, reasoning they reveal. After all, assessments uh, deal fundamentally with teachers and learners' awareness of ideas and reasoning. And strategies for formative assessment aim at helping teachers attend to what their students are thinking during the course of instruction. When our focus centered on these overly broad dimensions of te uh, teacher-student interactions, the specific substance of student thinking is not foregrounded and opportunities to examine disciplinary thinking are largely missed and uh, even worse, misconceptions are not dismantled or even reinforced. To address this phenomenon, there's a need for maintaining attention to disciplinary substance. Um, so uh, that what we learned about that through the sociocognitive approach is relevant, but there's also a gap, right? So um, um, instructional conversations, perhaps, more than items on a test, focus on disciplinary substance are better posed to present qualitative insight into student understanding. Yet this is only possible without the presumption of content as a body of correct information centered on terminology, which is selected in advance as lesson objectives. So uh, even extant literature still does not problematize teacher moves that do not generally pull students into discussion about the reasoning about claims they make about science, for example, phenomena. Disciplinary understanding would need much more than matter of fact information that is often reiterated by teachers. Lots of the literature in this area, when they present um, dialogues, interactions between student and teachers, really highlight the focus that teachers are doing on specific vocabulary. Um, but equal attention should be given to the evidence and reasoning supporting student claims conclusions, as well as evidence and reasoning um, that could refute the student's ideas. For this to occur effectively, assessment needs to be made more uh, than providing teachers with particular strategies and techniques for teachers to employ to elicit student ideas. Teacher develop inform development informative assessments should also target the substance of teacher moves, linguistic moves in particular, such as questioning and feedback. We know much, uh, from past research that effective use of formative assessment can have a significant influence on student achievement. Teacher questioning has been shown to change the discourse patterns in classrooms away from more typical imitation or initiation response and um, evaluation to a freer flowing exchange of ideas. A focus on disciplinary uh, substance would provide the kinds of assessment activity systems activity systems that impact student disciplinary understanding. Another danger of a focus of instructional conversation, conversation solely centered on correct terminology is that what gets privileged is abstract symbolic representation, um, or in other words, what is acquired and retained. Such a focus can and has been shown to exclude the participation of underserved student groups. Format formative assessments, that adhere to assumptions focused narrowly on traditional assessment tasks that are often not relevant to diverse students. As such, assess assessments systems in this context do not centralize students' identities in ways that increase affordances to make disciplinary options thinkable and feasible. That in other words, they see themselves as being able to participate in those discourse communities. Assessment systems that productively pulls minoritized students into disciplinary practices need to be designed in ways that expand what it means to learn a given discipline. That is, it disrupts what it means to learn to be good at a given disciplinary practice. To achieve this in diverse settings, we need more unconventional forms of assessment by legitimizing learners' non-traditional ways of thinking, talking, and doing, and by integrating students' community, home, and school lives into the work of the school. These assessments are better poised to engage students in learning processes and thereby increase learning opportunities. But more needs to be done, uh, done to, to, to learn about how to balance what has been learned from the sociocognitive approach to learning and assessment to increase student understanding and complex ideas, reasoning, and practices with the sociocultural approach. So I'm glad um, there was time taken to sort of really describe what that is. 
with equally compelling research that shows that developing student identities, engagement and engagement requires centering their ways of knowing and, and, um, and talking and how that can increase opportunities to learn and also for reaching, uh, reaching equity goals. But the question remains, so how do, but the, this is a careful balance, right? How do you center student experience while also developing their linguistic resources to reduce cognitive loads so that they can focus on the reasoning? Um, discourse communities, there's a body of work that shows that they, it reflects identities. So how do we take those understandings about valuing different ways of thinking and talking, but also develop those disciplinary ident identities through language that increases and pulls more students into disciplinary conversations. And that's, with that, I'll end. Thanks, Anita. I, I appreciate the, the idea of unconventional forms of assessment. I think many of us are kind of circling around that um, uh, on this panel, certainly, but also in the industry. So our, our next presenter is uh, Howard Everson. Howard is professor of educational psychology and psychometrics at the grad school at CUNY and senior research scientist at SRI International in Menlo Park, California. Take it away, Howard. Well, thank you, uh, Wyatt. Um, it's a privilege to be here, a pleasure and an honor for sure. I've worked with Professor Gordon uh, for more than well, he and I were just talking about this the other day, probably more than 25 years now from our beginning with our days back in the early 90s at the College Board. Um, we have struggled collectively uh, with this idea of the what, what Professor Gordon calls the pedagogical troika. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, which essentially the idea is, the essential aspects of the idea is that it's thinking hard about how to unify instructional design, curriculum and, and instructional design with assessment design to meet the challenges that Professor Gordon has put forward in much of his work, or, or what we are calling in, in the work that we do together with him, the pedagogical troika. Uh, in, in developing this work and trying to apply it, and I'll talk talk in a minute about how we're doing that. It's, it's inescapable to me that what we're facing here is a, what we call, what the, what the engineering field calls a wicked design problem. And would you go to the next uh, slide? Yeah, so a wicked, well, so what is a wicked design problem? It's a problem that's complex and human learning is assuredly complex. It's multi-layered. And in the case of education in the United States, we have multiple disciplines, we have multiple cu curricula and multiple uh, instructional foci. Um, uh, so it's clearly multi-layered and it's diffuse. It's not well understood. Uh, we are dealing with di different academic disciplines here in the United States that are, have, have uh, boundaries that are less than permeable sometimes. And, and it, it presents a problem that in reality, one size may not fit all situations, all schools, all disciplines, all teaching activities. So it's a, it's a, it's a formidable challenge. Uh, I've been working on a project for the past three year a federally funded project. This is now, we're in now year two, where we're trying to, design and develop and embed uh, assessment, assessments, uh, complex assessments, multi-dimensional assessments uh, in the, the discipline of science. And we're using uh, as our guidance, the standards that were developed in, in, in what's called the next generation science standards. These call for uh, a set of performance expectations or standards in grades five and grade eight, which is where we're focusing on those two grades, five and eight. Um, the, um, the challenge before us and why we, are refer we refer to it as a wicked, as a wicked problem is that although, although we have the science standards promulgated largely by the, the National Academy of Sciences, uh, most states have adopted 
the science standards in one way or another. And I want to stress the fact that there is variety in how those standards were adopted. Some states adopted them fully, cold cloth, others modified, as you can imagine, depending upon the, the cultural issues and policies of various states uh, across the country. Um, they've done this as well in, in English language arts and in math, most of the time with an emphasis on accountability. The work we're doing has uh, less of an emphasis on accountability and more of a focus on develop, trying to design and develop assessments that can be embedded and inserted and integrated into the curricula and instruction of the science standards. The challenge, which, which makes it difficult, is, that, is it, our issues related to going to scale. There are 1,300 or more school districts in the United States. Each of those districts uh, develop is, or adopt a curricula to suit their specific needs and schools and teaching faculty. So there's lots of variability in curricula. And, if, and curriculum and instruction, as I'm sure all of you know, is locally controlled. So there's, again, the issue of the multi-layered the diffuseness and the complexity of the problem. Can you go to the, to the next slide? I'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, so, so this graphic that we use guides our work on this science project and th this particular version of the graphic, which is, which is essentially the same as the, as the pedagogical troika idea that Professor Gordon has been uh, positing that comes from what students, knowing what students know, uh, it, it really seminal work that was done by the National Research Council back in the early 2000s, I think it's 2001 is when, it's, when it was published. Um, the, as it turns out in, in the work that we're doing, the assessment side of the work is probably the easier challenge of, of the three challenges here, the curriculum challenge, the instructional challenge, and the assessment challenge. The assessment design and development work has, uh, has been relatively easy in the sense that we're using a principal design approach. We have the standards to guide us, the performance expectations that are embedded in the next generation science standards to guide us. And we have, uh, because we're using a principled assessment design framework, we have uh, the, the tools that emanate from that uh, framework. We have uh, deep uh, domain analyses of the scientific work itself. And, and we're dealing in grades five and eight. So the, what's the focus of science may be a little bit different, maybe more physical sciences in grade five, and you can imagine more environmental sciences and uh, biological sciences in grade, grade eight. So there's some shift in the focus of the discipline as we move across the grade span. Um, so so the, the challenge for us is that we have to integrate multiple design frameworks. As I said, to begin with, we have, we have the principal assessment design framework, uh, which was developed by Bob Mislevy and, and his colleagues at ETS over the past 10 or 15 years, which is a very helpful set of, of design tools. It allows us to develop uh, task models and allows us to think more specifically and more clearly about the targets of assessment. The challenge is to find equally powerful frameworks for the curricula materials, which oftentimes come from publishers and from outside the schools and the teachers themselves, and the instructional frameworks, uh, how, what pedagogical techniques and activities are the teachers um, um, comfortable using and are using in, in what I would call the, a, a principled way, uh, a repetitive way, a way that really does um, become salient when you observe their instructional practices. For the, for, to help with that challenge, we've adopted uh, and adapted the framework of understanding by design, which was published probably 20 or so years ago by uh, Jay McKay and, um, and Grant Wiggins. Um, that's been helpful in the sense of addressing the issues of 
of having making salient the targets of assessment or the targets of learning. You can think about it that way in an instructional um, an instructional framework. Um, identifying those and then working with the teachers on this project, some 60 or so teachers, uh, about 50, 50 with grade five and grade eight, to help them think about and redesign their instructional approaches to understanding what the targets of, of learning really are, what, whether the targets of learning are aligned with the targets of assessment. And in this case, the targets of learning in the sciences are multidimensional. We want the students to learn the disciplinary core ideas like gravity and force and motion, for example. We also want them to develop and integrate the cross cutting the concepts that they need to use in science. And here you can think about some of the tools from mathematics, uh, graphing tools, uh, estimation tools, um, uh, familiarity with symbols and equations and, um, and the scientific and engineering practices themselves. So having the students uh, grapple with a particular phenomena, develop a model of that phenomena, and then think about how they would investigate more fully uh, how that those con disciplinary core ideas and the course coding con concepts allow them to think and work like like a scientist, for example. So these the uh, integrating this work as is ha, it is really the big big challenge, and it really does require uh, the assessment uh, um, field of assessment, the assessment practitioners, those psychometricians like myself and others who design assessments, to think and appreciate the role of the curricula and the curricula design. And I use the word curricula purposefully because they are they vary from locale to locale, district to district. Uh, and so we see this in science, uh, lots of variability. And, and the, 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 so addressing the curricula issues, the design and the instructional design issues. So, by what we're doing with the teachers in this project is we're really helping them develop their design thinking around instruction itself, as opposed to just speeding through the topic, one topic after another, after another. Uh, we've worked with them to redesign uh, their courses and, and work in smaller chunks of instructional units. Uh, we're in, as I said, we're in year two of the project. We've administered the assessments uh, or will administer the assessments of the next few months this, we're in this academic year. So we're expecting the teachers will administer some actually this month and, and again in February and March. We expect to have data on a, from about 1,600 or so students. Again, about a 50-50 split between grade five and grade eight. We have uh, cultural and demographic information on the, on the students and on the teachers. The teachers themselves have um, uh, completed very extensive questionnaires about their teaching practices and their, their targets of instruction or, or, and, or their learning objectives. And um, our hope is that by, <clears throat> well, by the late spring, we'll have, we'll have been able to analyze students' data but using we'll be using hierarchical nested designs uh, to determine the variation uh, in those assessments, and there'll be four assessments across for each instructional uh, uh, course is broken up into four units, and we'll have embedded assessments in each of those four units, multiple embedded assessments at the end of each of those four units. So we'll have a a real wealth of data. Um, uh, I, I'm going to close by, by uh, Randy, Randy Bennett, right before we began, reminded me of the, the motto of the, the US Navy's instruction battalion. And I'm going to paraphrase it a bit. It, it goes something like this. The difficult projects we do immediately, the impossible takes a little longer. 
so uh, uh, we're in we're in the process of trying to deal with this impossible set of uh, design uh, challenges, and uh, uh, ho hopefully you'll have me back next year when I when I'll have data and more to report on the actual finding. Thank you. Thank you so much, Howard. We, we look forward to to hearing about uh, progress on the uh, on all of your work, and also, you know, how, how to resolve the tension between, uh, you know, local control and top down policy. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So next up is uh, Stephen Sarisi. Stephen is distinguished university professor and director of uh, educational assessment in the College of Education at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, Stephen, take it off. take it over. Thank you, Wyatt. It's a little bit hard to to transition from student to speaker because I've been so eagerly listening to, to everything. And like others have said, it's a real real honor to be on this list today and to, to be able to be a participant in this celebration. I also just want to thank the organizers while we're on this slide to for, for putting me before Ezekiel, because I know once Ezekiel speaks, our brains are just going to be fully tapped to absorb all the information he's going to give us. So if I went after him, nobody would have the room to listen. So so thank you, Eva and colleagues. Uh, if we go to the next slide, we'll see um, the topic I've been asked to talk about. How can assessments be integrated with teaching and learning? So that's what I'll talk about today. If you don't mind going to the next slide. So I have a quote here just from one of the Friday seminars. I Every time Ed speaks, I'm taking notes, I'm writing things down. And it's. I think it's really important for people to know that um, I met Ed when he was a young man. I think Ed was 99 when we first started working together. So, so we go back a couple of years. And um, since that time, he's radically changed uh, the way I, I think about things. So I want to thank him for that. So this quote we have here, it's, you know, what what's electrifying for me? What's revolutionary for me in my conversations and, and being a student of Professor Gordon, we don't want to measure the outcome of learning. What? That's what I've been doing my whole career. I mean, I, I, I had black hair when I started out and, and, you know, for years until my hair went gray, I was, we're measuring the outcome of learning. And that is pushing us to use the process of measurement for learning. So let for learning be the driver, not of learning. Or as he said, even more succinctly today in the previous session, tests can measure, but they can also educate. So for someone like me, wow, I can actually not just you know develop a test and get some results, but use tests to educate, I think is, is really exciting. So now I've got a whole second career after the, the first career. So the purpose of the presentation today is to discuss the potential of educational tests to serve students, um, discuss the benefits of integrating assessment and instruction, and then discuss how we can integrate assessment and instruction. So let's go to the, the next and final slide. So if we think about instructionally supportive assessment, so where we are now and where we want to get to, because right now most assessments are not very instructionally supportive. So if we go from, if you could just press the, uh, yeah, from disruptive to inconspicuous. So what do I mean by that? First of all, if we think about the way testing is done today, particularly in a summative situation, it's like, okay, everybody, let's stop your instruction because we have to administer the state test now. And I know we'll get through it, but let's let's first get this testing out of the way and then we'll get back to instruction. So it's very disruptive. So, um, so if there's one thing we could do, one thing to just make things better is to stop assessment from being disruptive. There's a theory out there that the more time students spend getting instructed, the more they're going to learn. So think of assessment as a way of stopping instruction and, and not doing instruction. I think we really have to change that mindset. So assessment as part of instruction, instructionally supportive assessment would not be disruptive, right? So we can have the assessments as part of normal everyday education. So from disruptive to inconspicuous, you don't even know it. The next uh, bullet we have, from reporting to supporting. So we do a good job now of, you know, here's how someone did, uh, you know, go take these results and do some magic. So how, the question becomes, how can we make the test more supportive? 
part of it might be to provide actionable information to teachers in, in a in more immediate way. But also we could actually use the assessments to do crazy things like affirm students' uh, development, improve their academic self-concept. You're doing a good job while you're taking this assessment. Here are the things you know. So we'd like to see more of that. Um, the next sub bullet, please. So typically one size fits all. When I was a graduate student in my first decade or so of this field, again, when I had black hair, we were talking about test forms. Let's give this form, and then after it's after all, we'll give another test form. You know, since that time, we've gone computerized adaptive testing, and it, it was a big deal. Now we're tailoring the test to individual students, but that tailoring was based on, on difficulty, as if difficulty is the same for everybody. Now we're trying to use technology and to tailor each assessment for each individual learner. So some of the things that Randy has talked about and others have talked about, and uh, Howard and others, in, in designing for context and designing for um, different student characteristics and so forth. I think that's really important. Um, so some of the work we're doing at UMass as part of the Adult Skills Assessment Project is moving from the idea of test forms, of course, to item banks, but then even away from the idea of a test at all to having a, a warehouse or a repository of tasks that different stakeholders, including students themselves, can draw from to develop assessments in real time for whatever purposes they have. And why not use technology not just to decide what item to administer, but to develop the item in real time that's best matched to that student. So when we talk about personalized learning, we're really talking about specifically to each student. Um, next bullet, please. From prohibitive to interactive. So what do I mean by that? By prohibitive, a lot of the traditional assessments have been, take this set of items, don't you dare try and go back to another item. You already answered that item, right? Finish this item, once you answer it, you can't go back. Um, you have to take this set, you have to do it now, you have to do it in this time limit, to more interactive assessments. So can we give students you know, some, some choice, some agency in you know, what we might want to test them on, what they might want to read? Of course, we have some constraints around that. But the more flexibility, the more agency we can give students, uh, I think the more instructionally supportive they'll be because they will be part of the assessment project, not the, not the subjects of, of the assessment. Um, the next sub bullet, and I believe this is, is the last row here. If you can push the next, yeah. From standardized to understandardized. So understandardized is, is this concept that I've been pushing in just listening to, to Edmund Gordon to, take what we actually need from standardization. So depending on the purpose, um, you know, standardization, if, if we have to make comparisons across students, it might have a different set of requirements than if we don't, but to make them super flexible, right? So we can, first of all, understand, understand the full breadth of the student population that we're testing. So it takes research to understand the student population. It's um, some of the things that Professor de la Cruz was, was mentioning yesterday about really understanding who your students are. And then based on that research, based on that understanding, build the assessment system and the, and the dimensions of standardization, what has to be standardized and what can be flexible to accommodate that full breadth of the student population. So research on, uh, the, the population that would be part of this understandardized movement would be to see what funds of knowledge can students bring. Let's allow those funds of knowledge to be uh, pres present in the assessment situation. For example, we could allow things like translanguaging. We could allow things like um, uh, looking up translations in real times on assessment uh, if needed. We can allow for things like um, scaffolding when necessary and so forth. So this from to, to design tests, administer tests, and use results from tests that are more instructionally supportive it involves integrating assessment with, with, with instruction. It will have the benefits of engaging students, empowering and supporting students, providing more actionable information to teachers. And if we just revisit some of our, our notions that we think are, are so ingrained and we just have to do things these way and realize we actually don't have to do things um, the ways that they were done in the 19th century or even the 20th century. We could take the important things of standardization saying like, well, we want to have some things the same for everybody, or we want to have the materials we put in front of students understandable. 
Um, but we don't have to make those barriers. So I think I'll end there and I look forward to um, hearing uh, Professor Dixon Roman and discussing these ideas with all of you. Thanks. So I appreciate the comment about um, meeting Ed Gordon at 99. And, <laughs> you know, I met him much earlier, but he's always been a young man from my perspective in terms of his approach and his energy, right? So uh, next up is uh, Ezekiel Dixon Roman. He is associate professor in the School of Social Policy and Practice at, the, at UPenn. And he's the author of Inheriting Possibility uh, and recipient of the 2018 Outstanding Book Award from AERA. Like Stephen, I'm glad he's going last, so I don't have to follow him either. Good. You're up, Ezekiel. <laughs> oh, of course, I would hit the mute button twice. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Wyatt. Uh, I appreciate the introduction. Um, and and also, um, uh, it's been a pleasure to to hear all of my colleagues talk about the work, um, the work that they're doing, and and. Um, uh, and Steve, thank you for the building up. Um, hopefully I can deliver. I don't know. We'll see. But um, first, I'd like to begin by extending my appreciation um, to Eva Baker and, and Richard Duran and the UCLA Crest team for organizing this incredible symposium honoring the legacy of Edmund W. Gordon. I'm honored to be on this panel, I have to say, especially to be in conversation with a, such esteemed colleagues, some of which I had even been a mentee and student to. Um, i.e., for instance, Howard Everson. Um, today, I just want to share a few thoughts on efforts um, that I've been working on toward thinking about um, what are the potentialities, the possibilities of racial equity in learning analytics. Based on a, uh, based on a case study I, I have done on a learning analytics platform and, uh, and more generally, uh, I would say also based on um, based on work that I've been doing engaging cultural theory of technology, information theory and cybernetics, as well as black studies or black radical thought. Um, in particular, I would like to share some of what we learned through our case study and what potential directions or possibilities, maybe I might even say imaginings, um, uh, there might be toward the goal of racial equity. Um, and I should say the goal of racial equity through, through learning analytics. Um, as a potential uh, instrumentality of assessment that focuses on informing the transactions of teaching and learning, learning analytics seems to have promise of meeting what was learned by the Gordon Commission on the Future of Assessment and Education, as well as Professor Gordon's continued focus on um, focus and interest in assessment itself. Thus, as part of what Liz DeFredis, uh, Patty Lather, and I have called the computational turn, I began to examine a learning analytics platform with a specific focus on where are the potential mechanisms and processes of racializing forces might be. That is to say, what are the ways in which raciality or, racial, or raciali racializations become enfolded into the very technology or the platform or the system itself? This work was not simply a critical intervention, but rather what I would characterize as a post-critical or even a, cr a creative intervention, if you will, toward considering what might be the possibilities toward enabling racial equity through learning analytics. The platform my colleagues, uh, Amanayame Mensa and Phil Nichols, and I studied was an essay writing platform that provides real-time revision feedback to enhance the students' essay writing. Uh, we shall call this platform, this platform Essay Helper as a, as a pseudonym. Um, Essay Helper was designed to provide formative feedback to the student on, on how to enhance their writing based on um, specified state standards, um, uh, uh, state, state policy standards on, on uh, specifically um, literacy assessment. Um, and, and I should say, so the platform is designed so that one can write the essay outside the platform and upload it and instantaneously they get their, they're provided with feedback or they can actually do it in real time on the, on the platform itself. They can write the essay within the platform and also be provided um, instantaneously with feedback. Um, this, this was done um, by way of developing rubrics that were tied directly to state standards assessed on the state assessment. Uh, the students are provided with an estimate of 
how well they are doing on specific criteria such as supportive argument, language use, claim and focus of writing, and organization of writing on a scale of one to four, shown only as sort of lit up bars as, you, as you'll see in the, in the next slide. So you're, they're not actually getting a score that is like one, two, three, or four, but it's, it's lit up bars that, that, that indicates to what extent they're actually meeting, um, uh, meeting uh, uh, ex uh, expected um, standards and, um, and, and, the, and the particular criteria area. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So you can see the the uh, sort of the uh, at the top of this um, uh, uh, screenshot here. You can see at the top there are these four criteria areas, the ones that I just mentioned, um, and 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 these four bars that that become lit up based on how they're performing um, in the particular essay itself. And these are directly these are directly tied to um, state policy standards. To design the technology to do this. It necessitated the development of a set of training data of essays that was hand scored based on these rubrics. Um, st the Stanford Core Natural Language Processing Algorithm, machine learning algorithm, was then used to encode the essays for over 40 different features of language. Then a supervised learning ordinal logistic regression was used with the essay scores on each rubric as the criterion and the features from the natural language processing algorithms encoding of the essay. So um, the features were, um, were um, at, we, we might characterize as, as in sort of similar to a regression model kind of as a, as a predictor to the criterion of these actual rubric scores themselves. Um, then a supervised, oh, sorry. Um, this then allows the platform to be able to estimate the scoring of an essay on each rubric. Um, so what we what you then get is the um, based on the um, any particular essay that's uploaded and um, how the algorithm was trained, you then get these these um, estimates of how how any particular student and any particular essay um, is performing on, on, on these four different um, areas or criteria. And in addition to that, what you then have are, as you see on the left, um, uh, excuse me, the right-hand side of the, of the essay itself, this box that provides specific feedback. So it highlights a sentence or highlights an, a part of a sentence, and it, and it actually indicates to them what they potentially could do, what, what what is going on in this in this part in this in this part of the sentence or in this sentence and what they potentially can do to enhance it so providing generative feedback on how they can um, better perform and actually increase the estimated um, score um, in a in the particular rubric um, in a particular criteria area um, and the, and the feedback also is based on um, the uh, the those who were the scores of the training data, they also were used to help, help provide feedback, develop a whole sample of feedback that could then be automated in the system itself to provide um, feedback for the, for, the, for the students themselves. But also positive psychology was used as a way of also framing the feedback. So um, they're not, this feedback is not gonna say, no, this is wrong. Um, and you need to, and you need to go about this way. They'll say, they might say something to the effect of, um, "This was this paragraph was 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 structured in a in in a particular way. Um, if, uh, but yet, if you included a topic sentence in this in this paragraph, it actually would help to enhance the clarity or um, or, or the focus of the of the paragraph itself." Um, okay, so. Here's um, what I would say um, I think is important that um, we learned from, from this work. And I'm only going to speak to three important, what I would char characterize as important pathways by which racializing forces become folded into the platform. Um, it, there were a number of other ways that we do that we do speak to, but uh, there are three at least I want to uh, share today with, with us to actually help potentially even inform conversations, because I, I think there's a way in which um, this work is also in conversation with uh, um, a number of my colleagues' works in, on, on, the, on the panel, um, including um, Randy's, um, um, uh, what Randy shared about, about AI and, a pers and personalized learning, um, um, and some of, some of Howard's work as well. So anyways, so there are 
three areas. One is the rubrics are tied directly to state policy standards, as I mentioned. Um, and, and as a result of testing, testing um, as a result that the, because they're tied directly to policy standards and testing, it shapes an all, already um, constituted hegemonized mode uh, and style of writing, right? So on the one hand, we might say, well, this is how we would like to see students perform um, and, and, and that this is a, an important sort of outcome um, in, in relation to writing. And, but yet um, we need to also take seriously the ways in which those state standards also are constituting a particular hegemony around styles and modes of writing expression itself and the ways in which by literally making a platform that becomes almost a quotidian hand of the state, if you will, that's working in shaping the styles and modes of writing in the students on the, it literally within the everyday within the classroom, how does that begin to shape a, 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 an overdetermined hegemonized form of writing and even more what I would characterize even more problematically, even more concerningly, almost a violent chiseling away um, uh, out, out of the various ways of creative expression, even poetic expression. So for instance, if there is any form of poetic styles of writing or even poetic prose that's used in the, in the, in the writing, it will literally be scored negatively and, and, and the platform will seek to provide feedback in a generative way but molding it out, if you will. The model, second, the model is not only trained based on the narrow hegemonic rubrics of writing, but also the training data is limited both by way of the limits of the natural language processing algorithms capacity to account for more than one language or even degrees of fluency with the English language, producing an overdetermined constitution of language or what Jonathan Rosa and Nelson Flores have called racial linguistics. Thus, the platform was not recommended, in fact, for ELL learners um, or ELL students, nor was it able to perform well with the variation of English language performativities. And then third, um, the recursive feedback is a static closed model. So, um, in other words, the system is not actively learning. So as it's processing, as it's taking um, in new essays from students, it's not, the, the system is not learning from those new essays. It's the model is trained based on the training data and it's deployed based on those fixed parameters. Um, as a result, uh, so I should say, the system is not actively learning from the data, nor does it have the capacity as a result, to adapt to the various ways of being and knowing that the students bring to the platform itself. Um, we might even put this another way, that it, that it lacks the capacity to adapt to the various ways and modes of expression of writing that students bring to the platform. As I mentioned before, the more poetic and creative styles of writing would be opaque and indeterminate to the closed recursive system of this model and would be literally molded out, chiseled away based on the feedback and the act and the estimates on each of these criteria. So, okay, there are these three pathways where we, we identify, where we argue that there are clear ways in which racializing forces become enfolded into the system itself and actually this, in, in enacting the system to become a racializing force on shaping the students and the students' ways of, of expression of writing or, or even constituting um, what they then understand of their own capacities, their own self-efficacies in writing. So what can we do about this? Um, I'm gonna keep this very limited because um, I actually would like to engage this more in conversation. Um, but when I'm, let me first say, one, it needs to be a shift in the, in the, in the ethical political lens and, and framing to the design of such, of, of, of such of learning analytics platforms, such as, such as the, the, the example here. And what I mean by that is, um, it, can we shift the lens 
to be not about the individual student, as in fact is the, the, is the dominant eth um, Western frame for ethics, that is to be focused on the individual as a discrete in unit or, 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 or person, if you will, but actually focus on a kind of what I would characterize as a relational ethics. One that actually takes seriously that um, how we, um, how the feedback of the system itself is contingent on the, the, is contingent on the other. Or to put it another way, um, that the existence of my own existence is tied to, to, to the other. Or, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find another way of putting this, but basically um, a form of ethics that takes a mutual understanding that, are, that understands that um, there is no in discrete individual, that the individual is always inseparable from the other. And as such, then what does that then mean for how the how the the platform begins to think about and or approaches the question of the logics and modes of writing itself. So, with that, I think part of that means developing rubrics that are dislinked or not linked to state standards. Um, in fact, thinking about the ways in which um, rubrics could be developed. Um, by community informed, and I'm going to put in quotations here, community informed uh, values and styles of writing. Um, and in fact, I would say this would necessitate a stakeholder approach where there's thoughtfulness in who is included in the development of the rubrics and the scoring of the essays themselves. And I would say, including the students, including students of the community itself. Um, the other thing, and I think uh, it's two two things. Um, one is that natural language processing technology, we just are going to have to wait for its development. To what extent we can even imagine a future where natural language processing can handle much better the variation of, of language expression um, is going to be very much so what these technologies will continue to be contingent on, that very potentiality. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention is um, the necessity to for the development, and this I should say is really more in the realm of a kind of imagining and speculative, but the necessity for thinking about the development of recursive systems that are not closed, let alone fixed, but are actively learning and based on an open feedback system that seeks to produce difference in its logic in, a, in such a way that it becomes open to the multiplicity of being and knowing. That is to say, doesn't it wouldn't matter who enters, if you will, the interaction and engagement with the system, but that the system is allopoetic or, or, or heteropoetic is is fundamentally open to providing feedback, meeting the meeting the person where they are in their ways of being and knowing, and being able to provide a fluid feedback system to where they are in such a way that it can lead to the potentiality of, of enabling even the creative and poetic expressions of, of styles of writing and of being and knowing. Okay, I'm gonna stop on that and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Ezekiel. So, um, I, I, yeah, look, there's, there's certainly a lot to unpack there. And key to that is the, you know, as we look to technology is sometimes a uh, a panacea, right? In, in the edu education world, there's there's certainly a lot to think about, and with externalities of implementation for new new modes of testing and new new types of technology in particular. So I'm going to open up the discussion here um, with a couple of questions. If uh, if anyone else has questions, feel free to pose them. Uh, hopefully, this is a, a open dialogue. But um, you know, the first question is building on um, uh, I think what Randy presented, but also what Ezekiel followed up on, and uh, the question is, uh, what are our thoughts um, surrounding the current tension between equity and AI and how we build a foundation um, uh, for technology use and AI use while those tensions are still being solved? Can we even can we even do that at this point? I, I don't have an answer to that, but I wrote down something Ezekiel just kind of ended with. Uh, what I wrote down was, I think the goal is it doesn't matter who enters the system, the system is open in the way I put it, because I couldn't catch everything. 
the system is open to full feedback in a way that enables and empowers all who enter it. Now, I don't think that's the goal of, of people who are writing these these feedbacks and scoring systems and so forth, but I think that should be. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that, the, you know, part of the challenge is that uh, systems that are developed inherit the perspectives and uh, biases uh, of their developers, uh, as well as uh, the biases that are incorporated into training sets. So, uh, you know, potential <clears throat> for uh, problems comes from at least two sources. And uh, we have to be sure to diversify both of those sources uh, if we're going to produce systems that are uh, more equitable. I don't have anything yeah. to add. I think that was, I, I agree mm -hmm. both Steve and Randy on this. So yeah, go ahead, Howard. Howard. I wanted to add, especially with respect to Ezekiel's um, presentation on, 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 on the writing, I think also, um, you know, paying more attention on the theory of language use that are used as the assumptions, the, 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 the constraints that are built into those AI systems. That has very much to do also with um, the kinds of um, learning that the system does. And it seems like it's just not adequate because it's not even providing um, uh, reasonable uh, feedback to students' writings if they if they are if they have certain kinds of patterns that they can't even uh, handle. Um, so I think that's one way of tackling that issue. But again, but and that it, so it touches on both the biases of the system. It's just not um, the the developers per se, but uh, not not having carefully thought through. Um, just like we talked earlier about the theories that go into assessment development, that kind of um, um, design thinking has to go into these AI systems for the language use patterns that that yeah. we expect. Yeah. Uh huh. <clears throat> yep, that makes sense. Yeah. Ah, yeah. oh, there's the good professor who just joined us. <laughs> good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome. Professor, any comments from you on anything you've seen here or heard? Oh, on mute. Uh, you're on mute. You're on mute, Ed. We still can't hear you. If you're speaking. Oh, no. Nope. <laughs> uh, I don't know. You got what it. Else? There we go. It's, it's okay now. Yep. Okay. Yeah. okay now. I was about to say that I can't organize anything useful to say, but I do have a kind of question. <laughs> I keep uh, uh, hoping that we can find some help for me in thinking about what it is we know about assessment that would be helpful, useful for learners and those of us who teach learners. And as I was listening to the discussion today, uh, that was the question I was looking for an answer to. And it may have been buried in one of or more of your comments. Uh, if so, could somebody uh, highlight it for me, or is that uh, for our next quest, our next conference? It uh, sounds like you're asking. Use the process of assessment itself to improve the process of teaching and learning. Yeah. Uh, well, well, I'll offer one thought, and that comes from uh, the literature on uh, formative assessment, which suggests that to the extent that learners can, as a habit of mind, uh, learn to assess their own work as they're producing it, and after they've produced it, 
that habit of mind can be very helpful to them in improving the quality of not only their work, but of their learning. So that's a metacognitive uh, kind of habit that uh, uh, is assessment, right, in real time uh, that can very, be very uh, productive uh, as a learning tool. So my old comp composition teacher who insisted that I proofread, reread, uh, edit what I had written is telling me the same thing, right? Yeah, except that mm -hmm. what uh, she or he, I think, was attempting to do was get you to proofread and edit as a habit of mind not wait until he or she told you, right? right? So that's the difference. That, that the no, review no. and edit is a habit by which I learn. Right, yes, okay, exactly. I got that. No, no. But no. also being, be, uh, you know, helping students initiate in that activity comes before that, right? So yes, setting yes. up the tasks in ways that pulls them in, gets them motivated and engaged in the process so that they do, because that's effortful, right? That takes effort. And so they have to buy into that uh, activity to be able to put forth the effort that it'll take to, to, to edit and proofread before submitting it for initial assessment. Ed, this is Howard. Uh, one of the things we're learning in the project I'm working on for the science standards is the um, at the beginning of the assessment development work to draw the teachers themselves into the process and to have them become much more comfortable with and familiar with ways of assessing their students in real time during the instructional uh, day or instructional week or unit. Uh, and what I'm seeing, I think, is that the teachers are developing a metacognition selves. They're becoming more aware of the role of assessment and how they can use it to provide timely feedback, not only to the students, but to themselves about whether their, their instructional work is focused on those targets of learning, those targets of achieve, achievement, or even if the targets are uh, process related, like improving the metacognition of their students as an example. So I, I see the classroom becoming more meta aware during this process. So I think both that it's operating, that metacognition and feedback is operating on multiple levels. I, I, I want to, I want to add to this, you know, um, cause I, I'm sort of piggybacking on both Randy and Howard's comments and the um, and really the the, the value mm -hmm. and importance of um, the development of those metacognitive processes for both teacher and student for literally the development of those habits of mind as as Randy put it. Um, yet I I, I kind of want to put this in relationship to a broader sort of. Um, I might characterize this political economic landscape, right? Where you've had for, for over a century now, um, the move of capitalism has been one of moving to reliability, efficiency via technology, some form of instrumentation. Testing was, measurement and testing was one of them, right? So. Think about the developments, why even measurement and testing comes about. It is in fact, as a way of assessing in, a, in an understood reliable and impartial way, the intelligence or the, or the capacities of a large sample or a large population, including placement into the military, including uh, uh, assessing for placement in, in college, so on and so forth. There's then a shift that does occur post-World War II that moves toward forms of instrumentation, forms of technology that are even engaging in a form of sentience, a form of reason, right, via the computer. Calculation 
computation brings about a new form of instrumentation that, in, that brings about what we now know as AI, machine learning, learning analytics, EDM. And again, the same move is about reliability, excuse me, efficiency and, and reliability, right? And, and in, this, in this instance, it's really about trying to, how do we displace or emplace the human? So bringing the tech, bringing tech in, in a way that displaces the human um, in a way that is assumed to be more efficient and more reliable. Yet, putting all the limitations to the technology to the side, in the classroom setting, is that, is that actually gaining us more than what the human is actually, has the capacity to do in those transactions? In other words, is, it, is that technology gaining us more when you have a teacher? I guess it depends on the, on the ratio, teacher to student, but is it actually gaining us more when the human, the human pedagogical authority of the classroom is able to actually do that? Um, and I guess, let me just add, I think part of what we might imagine is maybe not so much about a kind of sentient system to provide the feedback, but maybe developing teachers that have the capacity to read different forms of information and data in ways that help inform their metacognitive capacities to being responsive to the needs of students. So part of what I'm saying is, let's not embed that reason in the system. Let's just prov maybe providing more information, data for the teachers to do the reasoning themselves to enable the teachers themselves to do that process, to inform those transactions. And, I'll, and the last thing I'll say is, I, I don't care about the other large scale assessments. I'm, you all know me well. I'm, the, the standardized assessments I actually think are deeply problematic and run us into the issues of what I spoke to earlier, of how they become the drivers to even the developments of those technologies and literally, constituting hegemonies, narrow hegemonies. I hear a little tension in what you're saying, Ezekiel, between giving the teachers agency to act on the information in the way that they're best really empowered to do, and also supporting the teachers with information and helping them know what to do next. You know, is, there, is there some tension there? What do you see as the tension? So I, in part, what? So, I, yeah, go yeah ahead. let me let me explain a little. Sometimes people, first of all, sometimes we talk about the teacher as if the teacher is just this one homogeneous being, right? So people are like, teachers want this or teachers want that. I think some teachers don't want any information. They they want to be able to to have control of the classroom in the way they, they already do, and they're, they're comfortable with that. Others are like, I don't know what to do next. Please help me. So with that, you know, information that comes from assessments or from the process of assessments that, that could be helpful, you know, I, I'm listening to your comments. It's like, well, we don't want to constrain or hamstring the teachers in any way and take away their human agency by having some type of system that says, here's what you do next based on the information we're giving you. Versus some teachers are like, I don't know what to do next. Give me information. You know what I mean? So we want assessments to be useful and actionable we want the process of assessment to provide positive experiences that facilitate learning but at the same time you're saying you know we have to be careful because we could dictate too much and if as we dictate it could be all these biases that creep in and so forth so is there a tension between how do we make assessments helpful uh, versus how do we make assessments not too constraining can I respond or why I see you? Please. Stuff on here. Okay. Um, I think we have to be a bit more thoughtful about the type of data that's being provided for them. Um, in other words, does it necessarily have to be assessments? Could it be other forms of data that are literally sort of almost generated through the process of the daily transactions in the classroom that mm -hmm. then um, teachers can then almost refer to 
um, to be, uh, how do I put it, in, in almost a sense of kind of a, uh, uh, examining for themselves the patterns of, of the classroom, uh, of the data in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And as such, their examination is going to be much more situated, much more uh, uh, associated with the learners themselves, have much more information even beyond the data of the learners than any platform will be able to bring on. Um, and in some ways, what I'm suggesting is I don't even know if it necessarily would necessitate a me measures versus providing the, almost the data trails, if you will, of the generated transactions in, in, in the class. But, um, but at the same time, I, mean, I, I hear your point, Steve, I, and I'm but I gotta, I gotta wrestle with it too. So I, 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 I yeah. You know, as a, as I listen to the conversation, it, it strikes me, and I'm gonna tie this <clears> back <throat> what Howard was presenting. It's the, it's really the, the triangle, right? The points of the triangle of assessment, curriculum, and instruction, and how we can move those together simultaneously. Um, you know, I don't think we can modify assessment in isolation or curriculum or instruction. But I'm sure Howard, you have probably a lot of color to add to that. Yeah. Well, just I just wanted to make a comment. I mean, I think the time, the time is right for us to start addressing these issues of the, the, the learning, the tools, the AI, I'll call them AI tools, just for purposes of this, this discussion, because they're becoming uh, more ubiquitous in schools. Learning management systems uh, are here, whether we like them or not. And there's, you know, there's a couple of competitors, there's Blackboard. There's Google Classroom, which in the elementary and secondary schools has taken hold. At least we're seeing it in, in the science project that we're working on. Um, and there may be some others, other tools that are still being developed. So I think it's important for folks like us to start to, start to take a real serious look at those, uh, those tools and maybe start developing some case studies. Because remember, those, those tools for the most part are designed by computer scientists and folks working in computer science, Silicon Valley type shops. Uh, think Google Classroom, beautiful example of that, right? So that there's very little influence about teacher, let's call it teacher thinking, teacher reasoning in um, it, going into the design of those tools. And, and, and maybe communities of practitioners like ourselves uh, should uh, take heed. And I think that's one of the messages that Ezekiel is, is giving us. It's time to look at those tools. Those tools aren't gonna go away, I don't think. In fact, they're probably gonna become much more expansive. Uh, and so uh, it's, it'll be very hard to retrofit them later on in five or six or eight, 10 years from now. Um, so maybe it's time for us to start to, to bring them into our our sphere of influence and start thinking about what they mean. Otherwise, they're going to be driven by Bayesian algorithms, you know, uh, uh, and who knows what, what they'll produce. <laughs> Guys, so. I think we're, we're coming up to the end of our session here. I think this has been a, a really insightful and um, great discussion. And re regretfully, I think we're going to have to end uh, on that note. But thank you all very much. and. Uh, you know, looking forward to continuing the conversation individually with each of you guys. So.